Hey everyone, my name's Ross. I'm the student pastor here at Fellowship Church, and today I'll be sharing a message with you all. 2024 marks 10 years since I graduated college. I went to college in the greater Boston area, outside the city. So of course, for fun, we would often go into the city downtown by way of the T or subway. And I don't know why, well, I do know why, but taking the subway always made me feel anxious because I felt like I had no idea where I was going or where exactly to get off if we're going to a specific location downtown. I don't know how to go from orange line to the red line to the blue line. You know, I grew up in the woods of New Hampshire. I'm not from the city. And so because of that, I would just kind of follow my friends or the upperclassmen who knew their way around. But even so, there were times where we missed our stops. And there were actually times when we got on the wrong train, the, the wrong line as well to get to the, our destination. But what happens if you do miss your stop? Well, you get off at the next one and you either go to the other side of the station and get the ride back, or you walk up to ground level and you walk a couple blocks through the city to your destination. You know, it would be foolish if you missed your stop to just stay on the train, right? It'd be foolish to just continue staying on the train and find yourself completely distant from your intended destination. However, this is something that often happens within our minds, with our thoughts, reasonings, and intentions. We intend and desire to ride our train of thoughts to a healthy and faith-filled destination. But sometimes we miss that spot completely and we stay on the crazy train of thought for too long. Or even we get on the wrong train and we head in a completely different direction than we intended. We all do this. You have some sort of bodily pain, some symptom, and you go to the internet, you go to webmd.com and you self-diagnose and it turns out, oh my goodness, you have some disease you've never heard of before. Or within dating and marriage relationships when he or she isn't texting back and you start to think, well, you know, why aren't they texting me back? What could they be doing? Where, where are they? They said they'd be home by now. And you think maybe, oh my goodness, did something bad happen to them? Uh, did they get in an accident, you know? Or for you students, you take a test and you, you didn't do well on it, right? And you start to think, I'm stupid. I'm gonna fail this class. I'm gonna have to take it over again or go to summer school or maybe I should drop out, change my majors. I'm not gonna make it in the real world. Or even with your self-image and how you look, you, you notice one tiny imperfection. You have one little failure, then another, another, and it, you tend to notice these imperfections and you add them up and then it ruins your self-confidence and you think, no one will love me, I'll never make it. And, and, and I'll never be beautiful. See, all these trains of thoughts matter because your life, your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. We are constantly thinking, but we rarely pay attention to the patterns and habits of our thinking. Some experts estimate that the mind thinks about 12 to 60,000 thoughts a day. Now, some of you have met some people and you're like, I don't know about that, right? Doesn't seem to be much going on up there. No, but realistically, it is a hard, uh, to, it's hard to approximate the number of thoughts we have. You know, you can Google and you'll get all these different answers and studies, but let's just say we think a lot. But what's even more fascinating is that 75 to 80% of our thoughts are said to be negative. 75 to 80% of our thoughts are negative. And then 95% of our thoughts are repetitive. And so 95% of the time, what we're thinking about is probably something repetitive about something negative, about what you think about your, your life, negative things about uh, what you think about yourself, negative things about what you think about other people. And your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And if you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. In other words, if you tend to think, I can't do something, I'll never be able to do something, I don't have what it takes. If you think you can't, you probably won't. But if you think that you can by the grace of God, you probably will. If you dwell on your problems, the world's bad, it's getting worse, your problems are gonna overwhelm you. But instead, if you look for some solutions, if you believe and you can have faith and you'll, you'll find some solutions and you'll see faith arise. If you always feel like you're a victim, you will likely become a victim. 
If instead you believe that you can overcome by the power of Christ within you, then you can overcome. In so many cases, the quality of the life we experience and perceive is a reflection of the thoughts we think. So I want to do a little exercise with you all today. So we're honest with ourselves and each other. We're going to audit our thoughts. And so here we have a little scale from one to 10. All right. We're going to, we're going to score ourselves. And then we're going to add up our scores at the end to see, you know, where our mind is at. And so the first one here is worry versus peace. So worry being one, peace being 10. All right. So where are you? How would you score yourself with your average thoughts during the day? So when it comes to worry and peace, do you tend to wake up and have your mind drift toward fear of what could go wrong? I'm worried about my kids. I'm worried about my health. I'm worried about the economy. I'm worried about the state of the world and the direction that our world is heading and our country is out of control. Or do you find yourself more characterized uh, by peace? That even if things are bad, things are complicated, you find yourself casting your cares upon God and recognizing that there's a peace that goes beyond human understanding and you sense his presence, his goodness, his spirit within you, even when things aren't the way you want. So where would you say uh, your thoughts are here? How would you score yourself between worry and peace? You know, for me, ever since becoming a parent, I've noticed that my life of course, has become a lot more filled with fear and worry, right? I'm trying to protect my kids, raise them right. And so that has brought a lot more fear into my life. A lot more fear occupies my life out of protecting and loving my kids in the best way that I can. And, and of course, that is good. But a lot of times, it can take me on a crazy train of thought and, and to a place where I don't want to be that's kind of, you know, making me paralyzed with my decision making when it comes to my children. And so it's important for me in that, that time to remember God loves my kids more than I do, right? And that brings me peace. All right, the next scale, the next uh, category here is negative thoughts versus positive thoughts. So do you wake up and find yourself uh, negative and critical of people and assuming the worst instead of believing the best? Do you look at your day and say, oh, it's going to be a hard day. It's going to be bad. To, you know, times are tough. It's gonna be, I'm always so busy. There's not enough time. There's not enough me to go around. And, or do you wake up with a positive faith? And again, even if things are difficult, you say, you, you know what? Christ is with me. He helps me overcome. And things may be difficult in the world, but I'm thankful for God who's working all things together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So where do you uh, uh, rank yourself here, number one through ten? And then finally, the next category is worldly versus eternal. And so are your thoughts more worldly, meaning uh, you're more concerned about what you have and what you wear and, and what you look like, your self-image, your, your success, and, and who liked your post, and how many followers you, that you have, and what everybody thinks about you, or do they drift towards the eternal, which is that God has given you resources and responsibilities to steward and spiritual gifts to use and... And what you have is actually to be invested and given to make a difference in the lives of the people around you and to advancing God's kingdom. All right, go ahead, add up those scores. And did anyone get a perfect 30? All right, probably not. And if you did, then we'll have you come preach, okay? Because you're an expert then. All right, I don't think any of us got a perfect 30. Um, but here's the thing. I know that score could fluctuate day to day, but I think we would all agree that it would be a huge benefit and a desire to see that number increase. I mean, that's where we want to head as a church. Pastor Andy shared that last week that he's got a plan for the next few months, some things to teach about, about the disruptions of life that we face. All these disruptions also affect our thoughts and the way that we think. And so that's where we're headed as a church. We want to tackle and navigate the, the stress and the worry and the, and the worldly and the negative things that are going on all around us and how we can navigate through that. But today we're talking about our thoughts. And our thoughts are often at war with what God says about you. 
and what God says about your life. There is a war going on within our minds, and that's why this message today is titled Winning the War in Your Mind. And this is actually based on a book. Uh, A lot of the content for today is based on a book called Winning the War in Your Mind by Pastor Craig Rochelle. So I credit him with a lot of the content in this message, and I highly encourage that you read it. But often our thoughts are at war, right? These negative, worldly, and and worryful thoughts are all at war with what God says and His promises in our life. And the more we dwell on them, and the more that we stay on the train and don't get off, the greater chance that those thoughts will lead us to a destination called bondage. Imagine it like this. I'm sure you've seen this uh, somewhere in your life where if you walk out let's just say in in a field or a yard uh, or the woods and you walk the same path for a hundred days straight. If I walk across uh, the the, the yard for a hundred days straight, what would I do? I would create a rut in my yard if I take the same path every single day for a hundred days. So once, think about this with your thoughts, once you begin to think a negative, anxious, worldly thought repetitively, you're creating neural pathways in your brain. You're creating these ruts in your brain that the more often we think that thought, the more the connection is there and it's easier to think that thought again and again and again. And before long, whatever we have been thinking becomes our default way of thinking and it becomes a stronghold. It becomes bondage. It becomes a prison of worry or negativity or worldly type of thinking. And this is an issue if we allow these strongholds within our minds because Jesus is in the business of setting people free. Some of you right now don't have what God wants you to have and are not living the life that God wants you to live because you're stuck behind an unlocked door, right? Jesus wants to free us from these strongholds that we place in our mind with the negativity and the worry and the worldly And he's right there knocking on that unlocked door. I think of uh, Revelation 3.20 where Jesus says, Look, I stand at the door and knock. And if you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And we will share a meal together as friends. So just go ahead, open that door to your mind. Jesus wants you to, to free you from those strongholds, right? So when it comes to those strongholds, I think about, you know, what is it about Jesus that does set us free? Well, it's because Jesus is truth, right? He's the way, the truth, and the life, and he provides truth in our life. I think of uh, what he says in John where he says, You are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teaching, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Jesus wants people to know the truth. Why? Because in truth, there is freedom. We gain freedom by understanding what's real, what's reality, the right perspective in any circumstance we face. His truth, what he says, what he teaches, his word gives us freedom from any stronghold. So again, when thinking about those neural pathways and ruts of negativity, anxiousness, or worldly thoughts and and worry that we create, like a path that we create in the woods or our yard after walking a hundred days straight. But what happens if I stay off that path for another hundred days? What happens if I don't walk that path anymore? Well, the grass begins to grow back. It's not as easy to walk the path anymore. And so instead, we forge a new pathway We forge a new rut and and path in our brain toward the truth. And that truth ultimately sets me free. So today I want to share with you how to begin creating these new paths towards peace, the positive, and the eternal. So one of the ways that we can create these new paths is by defining and demolishing the strongholds that we create in our minds. With this, I think of 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5, where the Apostle Paul writes, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. 
and listen to this, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Wow. Listen, to put this into context, Paul is defending his apostolic authority against critics in Corinth who questioned his credentials and methods. And so they were, these guys were going around saying some bad things about Paul, trying to discredit him. And here's the thing, Paul couldn't control what these people thought of him. And he writes to this church about the situation and then he, he uses it as, as a teaching moment. And, he's, and he says, hey, we don't fight our circumstances. We don't fight these sort of situations like the, the, the way that the world does. Instead, we have a divine power that can destroy these strongholds. The strongholds are of false beliefs, the wrong perspectives and unbiblical reasonings. We have a divine power, a divine might and ability, the miraculous power of God within us to tear down these lines of thinking, these arguments of false claims that come from other people or the lies that we listen to in our own minds. You know, if it's against what we know to be true about God and what he says, then we demolish it and we take captive every thought and we make it obedient to Christ. We make it obedient to the truth. In this text, I see an imagery of a war and a battle, right? And when you think about war, it's important that you define and know your enemy. In this case, you, you know in your mind the arguments that are at war with God, right? Those lies that we listen to, the, the worry, the negativity, the worldly thought, all that's with, at war with God. We define it. And then we lay siege to our enemy. We lay siege to the stronghold, the way of thinking we've defaulted to, and we tear it down. And then you start taking captives in that stronghold, right? You take every thought captive and you, you rehabilitate these captives. You rehabilitate your thoughts back to Christ, the truth. Because here's the thing. You are either going to take your thoughts captive, like he says here, or your thoughts are going to take you captive and place you in bondage. But we don't have to be a prisoner to our thoughts. We can take them captive. We have that divine power within us. We are to tear it down, right? We put those thoughts in jail. We interrogate it. And we put that thought on trial. Is this thought obedient to the truth? Or is it opposed to Jesus and his teachings? In God's word. If not, we make that thought obedient to Christ and we replace it with what is true. So define the stronghold and demolish it. What is the biggest mental stronghold that you've created that's holding you back? You might think over and over again, maybe I'm not good enough, or my past is too bad for God to use me, or I can't trust the people around me, or I'm always going to battle with my weight, or I'm, I'm never going to be good with my money, or I can never be close to God, or I'll never find a job that's fulfilling with something that I, I love, or all my relationships are always going to break down, or I'm worried about my kid's future. Whatever it is, you have divine power to demolish that stronghold and to take captive those thoughts to the spirit that's within you. Another way to create these pathways to, to peace, positivity, and the eternal mindset is to take your mind back. I'm staying with this kind of war analogy, right? Because after you lay siege to the stronghold, after you take the captives, it's time to take that land back. It's time to reclaim that ground, reclaim your mind and take it back. And we do that in a number of ways. Right? But we do that by replacing the negative, the lie, the worry with that truth that sets us free. And we can reclaim uh, our mind a few ways this way. And the first way we're, is we're going to look at Philippians chapter 4. We're going to start in verse 8. And to give you context, the Apostle Paul was writing this from a Roman prison. And in this letter to the Philippians, this is how he decides to end his letter. He says this, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing I want to leave you with. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think, meditate about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you've learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then... The God of peace will be with you. 
He didn't say fix your thoughts on worst case scenario, on what you hate and what you're afraid of or what could go wrong, but fix your thought on what is true, what is good, what is right and pure and beautiful and worthy of praise and what's authentic and admirable and honorable. He says to meditate on these things, have moments of mindfulness, of focus. See, Christian meditation, right? It isn't an emptying of your mind, but instead it's a filling of your mind with all these things, with his goodness, the awareness of his blessings, and with gratitude. Paul says, fix your mind on these things, and he says to put into practice the things you've learned. Put into practice even these values, and the God of peace will be with you. So he says to think about truth. Focus on what is genuine and accurate, not false or misleading. Seek to be honest and have integrity with your thoughts and actions and with others. Meditate on things that you know to be true and true about God and true about what God says about you. He says to focus on what is noble, to think about the things that are honorable, to value your integrity, to have self-respect and remain respectful to others. Many times our thoughts can go, go crazy and our minds go crazy because of what our others are doing, right? Or what others have said to us. And a lot of times in those situations, we have to remain uh, keeping our honor and integrity and taking the high road. It says to focus on what is right. So this means to think on what is just and ethical, just to continue to just keep doing what is right in the eyes of God. To think about the things that are pure, meaning free from corruption. This could be avoiding the media or content that promotes harmful values or negativity, right? So think about the things that are pure and then practice by staying away from the things that are impure. So think about the things that are lovely. Focus on what is beautiful and delightful. Appreciate the beauty around you, whether in nature or, or the people that are in your lives through positive interaction with others. Give compliments. Give encouragement to other people. Celebrate others. So to think about the things that are admirable. Think about those around you who are doing so much good and, and the good that is happening around you and in your life. Recognize and celebrate someone else's hard work, their achievement in a genuine way. And also think about the good that you're doing or the good that you can join in on to continue to promote that good in the world. Think about the things that are excellent. Think about the best, strive for the best, and give your best. Think about the things that are praiseworthy. Consider and celebrate the things that are deserving of praise in your life. Recognize and give thanks to God for the blessings and the good gifts He gives. The second part within this text here and within taking back your mind is to answer the question, you know, what truth, what spiritual truth from God demolishes that stronghold? What is the spiritual truth that demolishes, that obliterates the stronghold? And this is where it takes some work and discipline on our part to know God's word. Just like Jesus said, you're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, implying that we're knowing God's teachings. We're knowing his words to specifically combat some of the lies we tell ourselves. I think of Psalm 119, 105, which says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. You know, we're talking about these pathways uh, and these neural pathways that we create in our minds towards these negative thoughts. But here we see, you know what? God's word is a light that leads the way. That, that directs our path. So beginning your day with scripture in the morning, I know it can sound difficult, it sounds cliche, but whatever you read can become your weapon for that day. Furthermore, you know, we talk about this all the time, but being entrenched and engaged with a community of believers consistently, not only on Sunday, but through groups during the week, those groups are opportunities that, to allow others to help you take your mind back. And that's what I find in my life, that a lot of times uh, the, the, the strongholds are being demolished and I'm taking my mind, reclaiming ground because of what others have spoken into my life, because of other people pointing me to the beautiful, the true, the noble, the admirable, other people in my life around us, community, right? That is what the church is about. So consistently being within that, right, is a way to take your mind back. And finally, prayer. Prayer is a form of meditation. 
You know, right before the scripture we just read, Paul says to not to be anxious about anything, but pray about everything. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Prayer. It isn't our last line of defense. It's our first line of offense. Pray about everything. And God's peace, which transcends all understanding, that doesn't make sense for the circumstance, that peace, it's going to guard your hearts and it's going to guard your mind. Dr. Carolyn Leaf, in her book, Switch on Your Brain, actually studied this and wrote about this. And she said it's been found that 12 minutes of daily focused prayer over an eight-week period can change the brain to such an extent that it can be measured on a brain scan. Prayer helps emotional regulation. It increases empathy and compassion. It helps with stress reduction, brain connectivity, and increased gray matter density in brain regions related to attention, emotions, and self-awareness. So just as the toxic and the negative and the worry can harm your brain and create these bad neural pathways, prayer heals your brain. It transforms your brain. It literally renews your mind and it brings you peace. It heals you physically, mentally, and spiritually. So peace, it's not received by the resolution of external circumstances or being in control of the situation or other people, but rather it's received by taking your mind back, by fixing it on what is true and admirable, excellent, praiseworthy, noble, right, and pure. Meditating on these things and then practicing them, creating spiritual disciplines in our life, will bring us peace. So one final way to create these new pathways is to then reconstruct your outlook. Reconstruct your outlook. This is creating a different way of looking at a situation or relationship which will alter the meaning it holds in your life. See, we can demolish the strongholds. We can take captive our thoughts. We can reclaim some ground in our minds and take it back. But that doesn't mean our circumstances have changed. You know, I find that being the struggle in my life, right? I often know the truth. I often can be filled with faith. I can be taking my thoughts with captive. Uh, and then all of a sudden I think, well, that doesn't change my situation. That doesn't change the decision I have to make. Or that doesn't change what I'm facing or what happened or... Uh, you know, how am I supposed to look at this now, even though I know God's truth and believe in it? Because it's not always the facts that change. I can't always control what is happening or control other people. However, what I can control, you know, what I can control is how I look at it, how I interpret it, and that will change its meaning for your life. I also think of another New Testament story. Since we've been talking about the Apostle Paul and his writings, we see this rebuilding, this reconstruction of outlook in his life too. Philippians 1, right? Again, the, the context of this is Paul is in jail. He says, now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. Even though he's in a horrible place right now, even though he's in jail, right? And his thoughts could definitely wander and lean towards the negative and the worry and the, and the worldly with what he has in his life. Instead, he, he reconstructs his outlook on the situation. He realizes, you know what? This is actually advancing the gospel. Everyone here in the palace guard, in this prison, is knowing I'm here because of Christ, and they're hearing the gospel. And everyone around me is all the more daring to share their faith because they know that whatever the circumstance is, the advancement of God's kingdom can take place. And that's such a different way to look at our situations. That means that even some of the worst moments or most mundane, trivial moments, the most frustrating moments within those, I can choose and I must choose to look for the goodness of God around me. To know his promises. To know his word and his truth within that circumstance. And within all the stuff that we face, the bad and the good, all of it impacts how we think. And within those circumstances, we don't measure God's 
goodness by our circumstances. Instead, we view our circumstances through the lens of God's unchanging goodness. Our circumstances, what we face, it doesn't define God's character. But instead, we approach whatever we're going through with the belief that God is always working for our ultimate good, even if we don't fully understand it. So whatever circumstance we face, whatever trial we go through, we can look at it through the lens of God's goodness and find God's goodness in it. Or we cannot. And we can let our circumstances and our trials and our, and our worry and our negativity define who we think God is and what his truth is. But whatever you're looking for, you'll find. Another pastor says that, that this is just like the difference between a vulture and a hummingbird. What does a vulture find? Every day a vulture flies around and it finds dead stuff, dead things and roadkill. But what does a hummingbird find? Every day the hummingbird finds sweet things. If you look for the good in your situation, you'll find the good. But if you look for the bad, you'll find the bad. If you want to see what's wrong every single day, you can find what's wrong and negative every single day. If you want to not like people, you can find a ton of reasons to be critical of others and not like them. But if you want to look for God, if you want to see faith, if you want to see the best you can, if you want to look for where God is working, you will see he's still on the throne and he's still good and he's still powerful, and he still answers prayers. So, define and demolish the stronghold. Take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ and his teachings. Take back your mind. Reclaim that ground by filling it with what is true and noble and right and pure and worthy of praise and excellence and reframe with the right perspective. Reconstruct your outlook, choosing to see your circumstances through the lens of God's goodness, his promises, and his truth. Earlier, we audited our thoughts together. I want to challenge you to put into practice these steps we learned today to create some new pathways by creating new habits and maybe re-audit your thoughts a week from now, and I'll guarantee you will see that score increase. And a peace which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus.